Welcome, folks, to the My Black Diabetes Meal Plan podcast. Today, I'm joined again with Dr. Furman. Uh, he's here to basically answer some community questions today and uh, get at some of the questions that we had started in our previous conversation, particularly around fast food genocide. And the very first question I want to I want to ask you, Doc, before I, I open it up to the to the community for their for their questions, uh, the question I have is: in fast food genocide, you talk about the real damage that we do to our bodies when we just need something quick. You'll hear people say that I just need to get something quick. I just had to get something quick, so I just I just stopped over at Subway. I just stopped over at Chick Fil A. I just stopped over at McDonald's. Can you define for us what Group One carcinogens are? and what the havoc they can actually do to our bodies, what it is when we innocently pick them up and we promise that we'll just go ahead and start tomorrow. Yeah, well, you know, it's unfortunate, but it seems as if the foods that have the most dangers are obviously the ones that get people hooked and addicted to the wanting them and are hard to give up. The more dangerous the substance you put in your body, the more it could take over part of your self-control, so to speak. But one thing we know that's pretty dangerous is that when you cook oils and you heat up oils and fry foods, French fries or things like that, the oils become carcinogenic. And so we're talking here about the rancidity of oils, but red meats and processed meats are considered a class one carcinogen because they're closely linked to certain cancers, particularly colon cancer. But of course, Anytime you cook something at high heat, barbecue, fry, you know, make it crispy, darkened, you know, so I don't know, it's all empty calorie junk. I just, you know, to me, it's like taking drugs. Mm -hmm. A fast food restaurant is like going to inject your dr drugs for a bit for a fix because it's really just detrimental to your long-term health. There's no way around it. You're poisoning your body and you're poisoning your future and it's your body. Right. You only get one. You're hurting yourself intentionally, but you're really letting other people hurt you because the food themselves are, it's like you're getting hooked and now you have trouble getting off it. And the way you get off it is by abstaining from it, not going back and just getting for another quick fix. So you really got to go get away from those things. If you're hungry and you need something quick, eat a banana. Mm. You know? <laughs> What's quicker? Have a carrot, have some, um, you know, have an orange, have an apple with some nut butter on it, but you know, almond butter on it. I mean, what are you, there's a, um, um, there's a, a million, you know, I was, when I was in college, I used to, you know, I was an athlete then, but I would, I'd carry around sunflower seeds and almonds and walnuts in my pocket in a bag and I'd get hungry. I didn't, you know, I'd pull out an apple and I'd be eating some nuts and an apple. You gotta, you know, you realize that we're a natural animal meant to be eating natural foods. We can't eat fake foods and not, and expect to have a normal life because what I'm, what my mission here is and my passion is that I don't wanna see people's lives end in tragedy. And if you eat the foods that other people are eating all around you, you're gonna have the same tragic consequences with people getting bizarre diseases, you know, cancers and all kinds of cardiac arrhythmias and heart problems and eye problems and body problems and body. your body falls apart and your life becomes a living tragedy. One of the things that I've been able to pick up from you is I, I don't know the the T20 uh, plan that we've been we've been sharing with each person that comes on uh, on board. How did you do the chocolate ice cream? That ice cream, uh, folks, for, for folks who don't know, I posted this in the group, but um, there is a chocolate ice cream. It is the for people who are constantly talking about I need something quick, I need something sweet, I need something tasty. There's a way to get all of that. Right, people are, a lot of folks have, you know, they're chocoholics, they like, they have sweet tooths. There is a way to do a chocolate ice cream that does not make you feel uh, sluggish, doesn't make you feel tired after you eat it, makes you feel energized after you eat it. And it has uh, cocoa powder, frozen banana, almond milk, prunes. I never bought prunes before, never really used prunes before we started using the prunes in, our, in, in the ice cream. Uh, then we throw a little cinnamon and nutmeg in there. And, uh, and it, it tastes fantastic. So right. the, your ability to, and it's not easy to take foods that, that our body needs and turn them into things that you actually want to eat. 
So you're t whoever was working on that, I don't know if you're also a part-time chef, um, you know, in another life, or maybe that's what you're, that's what you're doing. You're spending your time in the kitchen. I imagine you have a team who's helping you with that, but those folks are fantastic because yeah. that ice cream is better than what I can go get at Briars. It's better than what I can go get down at the store. And it doesn't make me feel uh, depressed. It doesn't make me feel tired and sluggish. How were you able to put these recipes together uh, for folks that, I mean, that actually taste good and are good for you? Yeah, right. Isn't that the greatest thing? You know, and that's the thing is that to emphasize is people think they might be listening to us and feel they're giving something up and they're giving up their pleasure of eating to achieve good health. And they're weighing that if they want to give up their, all this pleasure to get better health. And they're, they're, that's, that's wrong. It's not true. You get more pleasure from eating because as you stop eating the heavily sweetened, excessively flavored junk food, your taste buds get stronger mm. and they get more sensitive. And then you learn these delicious recipes and you actually have more enjoyment of food because not only the food tastes as good and you can taste it better. You know, this, you're saying this delicious chocolate ice cream with no sweetener in it except for the real fruit, a little prune. <sighs> and the actual frozen banana. Right. And I make great vanilla ice cream with just the walnuts, the banana, and the vanilla bean powder. And you need no dates, no sweet, no dried fruit. It's just so delicious. Okay, just I need that recipe. I need that one. I need that one. That would be good. Just the three healthy, super healthy ingredients, frozen banana, walnuts, and real vanilla bean powder. Okay. And you whip it up. You can put a little soy milk in there to just make it so easier to blend in the blender. You make it into like a frothy ice cream. And then we don't even like regular ice cream because they can taste like they're so overly sweetened and they taste like bleach. You can taste chemicals in them. They used to wow. clean. You can taste it when your taste buds get strong. But what I'm saying right now, now you're a nutritarian. Now you put your health first and your taste buds got healthier and stronger. And now when you eat food, you not only enjoy the food just as much, but now emotionally, intellectually, and psychologically, you feel much more positive about what you're eating. Like you were saying, I'm eating something that's made from whole foods that's good for me now, and I, and I also like it. And you also feel like, wow, I'm, I have the intellectual awareness to know that I'm doing the right thing for my body as I'm enjoying the food, and I'm enjoying the natural beauty of the miraculous healing power of food, and I can appreciate the value of food and be grateful for the beautiful food of this earth. Mm. It's good for my body, not bad for my body. What people are eating isn't food, it's fake food. The fa that's, it's, it's designed by food scientists to get you hooked. It's not food. Food is what, you know, and it's amazing how you can actually go out into the, um, you know, the natural world and you could find so much natural foods out there. Even the weeds, like you could, even like the parsley is like a weed growing in the, you, the, you could, there's things you could actually find to eat. But what I'm saying right now is that pine nuts, these are natural wild strawberries, things that grow, you know, um, you know, wherever you go in the world, you could find different things to eat. But the point is, we're designed to be eating these natural foods. We're not designed as a species to be eating this processed junk food. And that's what's the cause of disease. We're creating these diseases that is not, it's not natural for the human species to be sick. Where our body is so disease resistant, we can live a long, long life in great health to 100 years old and to pay the price, you know, and so we're, we're paying a, a terrific price of human suffering that is not worth it for you to not to think you're going to enjoy your shortened life with all that pain and all those taking all those drugs just so you can eat fast food and commercial ice cream and baked goods is crazy right it's more of insanity that it's 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 food induced insanity because the food designers make these things to hook people right and and folks i just want you to track what Dr. Furman is saying in terms of his own inner transformation. It's not that if we took a, a young baby, Dr. Furman, and gave him regular store-bought ice cream his whole life, he wouldn't like it. He would probably be all about the fudge brownies and the fudge, all the stuff. But by making the right choices, he is conditioning and reconditioning his taste buds to prefer foods that are actually good for him. And, and there's no difference between what Dr. Furman is doing with his family and what we can do with ours. And, you know, to that point, I want to introduce you uh, to, to our community. One of the members who wants to, has a question, and wants to bring it to you. Um, his name is Nicholas. He's also a chef. And a part of 
our journey together and our work together is doing exactly what we just spoke about, taking food that we know we need to eat and making it taste good. I want to go ahead and make sure that Nick gets a, a, an opportunity to, to speak with you. And so we'll bring Nick on right now. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. How you doing? Excellent, excellent. Nick, this is your time uh, to ask uh, Dr. Furman anything that's on your mind. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put myself on, on mute and, and kind of hide the video. Um, but do take your time, right? This is, this is one of those moments where you're, you're speaking with somebody who's been helping diabetics for over 30 years uh, reverse their disease. And so I really want to make sure that you're getting uh, the most out of the, out of the conversation. So please, the time is yours. All right. All right, Dr. Furman. So the question I have, um, I know the FDA released a weight loss injection. Um, how will that how will that impact the diabetic community, in your opinion? My opinion is that um, the medical profession and, and new medications for diabetics and for weight loss uh, makes things worse, not better. They are, they're kind of like, um, how about you're an alcoholic and I give you a drug to reduce the, alcohol, reduce the um, hangover from alcoholism so you can go drink more. And now you're not going to feel so hungover because I gave you a drug to help with that. Right. You know I mean, it's like the medications for diabetes are like ena the enablers so people's blood sugars look better. So that now they can go back, continue to eat the diet that's causing them so much damage as if the damage isn't going to continue to occur just because you don't see all the numbers looking so bad. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm suggesting that you can't buy good health and you can't access more medical care for good health. And as drugs come into favor and out of favor, you don't get, you never get something for nothing because the efficacy of a medication is related to its toxicity. So I can give you a natural product. Have effect because they're poisons and they, I, the more you take the more you're prone to cancer even but the point i'm making is that these drugs you don't you never get it you can never take a drug and not pay a price there's always a negative price to pay because they're toxic and they have and the side effects are the effects they're just the effects you don't like the effects you want to get are the pharmacologic effects you don't get one without the other you don't get the pharmacologic effects without the poisonous effects as well they just may not be you know you're not feeling them or sensing them or noticing them, but they're still slowly aging your body and causing damage. There's no substitute when you're hitting yourself with a hammer and smashing your hand and crushing it. There's no substitute for stop hitting yourself with a hammer. You can't just take a drug as you continue to give it a slug every day. And the point I'm making, unless people change the way they eat and they live, and this is all about taking self-responsibility and self-control, which is hard takes initiative, determination, repetition, dedication, perseverance, being different from other people who are, committed, who are around you. Or, so you have to really take the initiative to start eating healthfully and eat a salad every day and then eat, and eat some beans and have some you know, peas and, and, and you know, to, in other words, and, and vegetables and have fruits and have nuts. And you have, to, you, have, you have to change the way you think about food and eat differently. You can't just take a pill or a shot or a drug and expect you to be able to still, you know, eat pizza and burgers and not pay a price. That's living in a fairy tale. And, you know, and people who are, you know, addicts and people have, everybody's a food addict. They come up, they try to um, believe the selling point and believe the scam. They want to hear that it's okay to do what they're doing and then they can get by with it. But, it does, but it's just, it's a false promise. It, it almost never works. The history of medicine shows drugs stay in favor for a while and eventually as enough people take them, we find out they're really dangerous and we stop and we give people a new drug. And then that comes in favor for a while and eventually we find out how dangerous that drug is and then that goes out of favor. You know what I mean? It's like, there's no magic in the world. There's no magic. There's no substitute for careful eating, eating the right amount, you know, exercising regularly, losing weight, keeping your weight down, eating, living on mostly vegetables, 
eating your G bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berry, eating right. There's no substitute for doing the right thing. You can't drug yourself into good health. You know, I don't know if you guys remember the Accord study and the government stopped it after eight years. They gave people more medical care and more drugs to control their glucose better. And they had more medical visits and, and, they, and they stopped, the government had to stop the study because people getting more medical care were dying much at a much more rapid rate, so much more rapid rate than the people not getting medical care. That even the diabetics with poor blood sugars not taking as many drugs were living longer than those with better blood sugars gets because they were drug taking the medications more. Just showing you that, all, that it's, it's a big trick. Your numbers look better, but you're not really better. And when you take these drugs, you think your numbers look better, so you keep eating the same foods, you actually are getting worse, not better. Makes right. sense. Appreciate that. Thank you. Great question, Nick. Uh, and, and one of the things that I really wanted to ask uh, Dr. Furman this time around was, you know, you, with the Accord study um, and even, even in fast food genocide, you're already there talking about uh, food deserts in urban communities. You were saying how eight, you know, there are 80% increases in the risk of stroke in these communities. Uh, people are two times as likely to die from heart attacks in these communities. Uh, four times as likely to die from kidney failure in these communities. And I'd personally like to know if, because a lot of times what we're talking about is, is sort of structural problems. And <laughs> as, as you're pointing out with the Accord study, more medicine doesn't, it didn't end up helping anything. I mean, it, it moved the, the number on the, on the data metrics, but the qualitative experience of being a healthy living person, uh, modern medicine didn't really move the needle on. And, mm -hmm. and what, what we're also seeing is that's just in, in the medical community, but then there's also a, um, a food community, a grocery right infrastructure problem that we're having that we're having where people can't get access to 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 great foods and we call these food deserts or as you as you uh as you call them and refer to them as food deserts but i'd personally like to know knowing what you know now if your community suddenly turned and became a food desert itself and you happen to be trapped in one what types of choices would you begin making today what would you do you know, um, the answer to the question is beans, dried beans and cabbages. And, and you, can get, you can get food that's, um, um, you can get foods even in that community that are health, that are, can be healthy. Not as much variety, not as much great tasting stuff. But you, have you ever heard of the Hispanic paradox? No, no, Hispanic, never. It, it means that they study in food deserts, Hispanics, and they found that they didn't have the bad outcomes with heart attacks and cancers compared to the, the black population, the same community, because their heritage was such that they're eating more beans. And the beans, the, the beans they were eating less fast food and consuming less um, meats and cheeses in the community because they were having more inherently in their heritage of eating more and more bean dishes like chilies and um, and bean stews. And they found that to the extent that beans increased in the diet, to that extent in the, in the families, these diseases got, were protected against. So all they did was give more people, it put more beans in their diet and they had better health outcomes because the beans replaced the meat and the hamburgers and the pizza and the French fries. So that's what the Hispanic paradox talks about. But the wow. answer is, is that there are, um, you know, I, I traveled in various parts of the world where there wasn't much produce available, but like I was in Czechoslovakia in the 1970s, below the, in the communist bloc countries where you'd go into a supermarket and all there was was like cabbage and, um, and maybe some citrus fruit, cabbage and a grapefruit, you know what I mean? And I'm, so I would be living on beans, sunflower seeds, cabbage and a grapefruit. I would have my nuts in a box, you know, I have my nuts and my sunflower seeds that I would travel with. And I had the, I, I bought the, I cooked the cooked cabbage or whatever vegetables I could get. And then I had, and then, I, then we traveled with beans and we'd either open a can of beans or we'd cook beans in our room in a, in a, on, a, on a hot plate, you know? And, um, and we got by, you know, um, because you can do it. You have, you know, it's like, how would I eat if I was in prison? 
you know, right. how would you eat if you, you pick the, you try to find the most health, the possibility of finding what's the safest thing to eat. And then how, what you can supplement, well, you know, what can you supplement with? Can I get azuki beans? Can I get red kidney beans? Can I get dried soybeans? These things are not expensive. You can even buy them in bulk. You know what my wife and I used to do when we were students and we didn't have money, we would go with a bunch of neighbors and we'd go to Hunts Point Market in the Bronx and we'd buy food from the wholesale markets, um, really very inexpensive, like a whole, you know, 25 pound bag of beans or a whole, you know, big thing of oranges that we, and we'd split it up between like 10 different families or everybody on, and we'd, you know, we'd, um, and we'd wind up spending a third of the price for food or something, you know what I mean? We'd buy food wholesale at the more at the wholesale market, you know, we'd go to, and we, um, anyway, so the point is, is that maybe you don't eat as gourmet, but you still got to eat healthy. Right. Right, and you're saying you're saying that even in a food desert, there is still an opportunity uh, for for eating in a healthful way, for not falling victim to those. I think you said eighty uh, percent uh, increases in the risk of stroke, right? And, and so there there is a way to to make sure that you're you're moving into your your older years with a stronger heart, uh, with stronger kidneys. Right with a with a mind that's intact, and you know, if, if there's an economic challenge here, you know, and a monetary challenge, you could figure out how to save money doing this. And plus, you think of when you're not working and not productive and not in good health. Mm. How do you help? That doesn't help your econ your um economic well being. Your monetary, you know, you got to be in good health to be and have your full mental faculties clicking. You got to if you're gonna, you have to eat healthy to be the best version of you you could be. Right. Number one. And number two, if you work with a group, you can still buy food in bulk and you can still travel outside of the community to buy certain things. And you can still, you know, there's things you can do. You can have things shipped in and it's not more expensive. If you're going to buy things even in bulk and split it up between family and people. And you could still save money. And, and as we people know that being not expensive and even, and there's, and even, you know, they have even these um, Asian grocers with lots of green vegetables that are at lower prices. And they, you can, um, so if there's an effort, we always say if they're, if the person is a food addict, they always have an excuse why it's difficult to do this or impossible mm. to do this. Mm. When a person is not a food addict and they are committed, there's always a way they can do it. They'll always, what am I traveling? What am I out with friends? What do I want to business associates? I can't do this because of this reason. But, but when you're committed, fully committed, there's no excuses. You just do it and you make, and you make it work. Right. But when you're, when you're not committed and you're a food addict, there's always an excuse or reason why you can't make it work, you know? Exactly. And, and just before, before we go, I can't believe we're almost out of time, uh, but before, before we, we go, I just want to go really deeply into that point you just made. It seems that you're familiar having worked with so many folks across all kinds of demographics, um, from, from likely very wealthy folks to, to folks who really weren't. And it sounds like you, you understand a certain strategy that families can use when uh, maybe maybe they don't, they're not on the, on the wealthy spectrum, not, you know, very, very wealthy. Um, have you seen people, if you could just give just a little bit more detail about what you were saying about being able to purchase the right foods and actually save money? Because I think a lot of folks, that is a huge uh, um, sort of problem or, or illusion, sort of illusory problem that people, um, they actually have to grapple with. And so if you right. could say just a little bit more. That's right. We're, a big soup. We're cooking a big pot of soup for 10 people, you know, and if, and if the soup and you're putting greens in the soup, it doesn't have to be the most expensive grade of greens. It can be cabbage and whatever, you know, whatever is relatively inexpensive. And then you're putting beans, which are inexpensive. And then the secret is to, if something's not going to taste good, you add more onion to it. Okay. You know, if it doesn't to make it taste better, put more onion in. Doesn't taste enough, put more onion in. It's going to taste good. The onions, you know, just people cook with onions. It tastes great. If the dressing doesn't taste great, put more roasted garlic in there. You know, roast the garlic in your own. Put more roasted garlic in there. You know, this, it, it tastes great. It doesn't, you just have to know the skills and, and to just do it. It's not that difficult. By cooking in bulk, by cooking for 10, right? You're, you're, you, people know, you know that you're going to save more when you buy one of those two or three big packs of beans and you're making it all at one time for a large group, right? That's going to, that basically it helps you achieve economy of scale, right? That's so it becomes- and you, could, you could always freeze things, but we, but I keep like, 
And also, we don't have time to cook every day and make a soup every day. We make a big soup once a week. And we put it in a big, I make that big giant pot and I clear out the top shelf of my refrigerator. I take it from the stove, which cooked the soup. And by the time I go to bed at night, it's kind of to cool down. I put the whole thing in the big shelf of my refrigerator. The next morning I take it out and I can aliquot it out. I can put it out into like 10 different containers. So when I'm going to work, I just grab a container of soup. So my lunch is just this heavy bean soup which is rich in beans. It has a lot of protein. It's very filling. It's a thick beanie soup and I can just grab it to go to work. And all I can do is add a salad, chop up some lettuce, add a salad, a piece of fruit and I have my lunch done. And that's the main meal of the day. It's done like that, boom. Quick. <laughs> Dr. Furman, I can't thank you enough for, for jumping on with us again. Um, you know, unfortunately we are out of time, uh, but, but thank you for fielding questions from uh, folks in the community. And I think we want to do a little bit more of that too, and have more people kind of come on and ask you their questions personally. Um, but what you've been able to give to us in terms of no matter where you are, no matter how um, detrimental the food desert that you may be in is, you have an ability to achieve nutritional excellence. And, and that strength and message of, of empowerment, I think is so critical. Uh, and so I, I thank you for giving it and, and I can't wait to, to actually speak with you again next month. And so thanks so much, Dr. Furman. We'll talk soon. My pleasure. Good luck. Good luck. Have a great week.